Okay. Hey, Jason. Happy National Fossil Day. Thanks. You too. How's it's it going over there? Of the year. I know. Yay. <laughs> I have on my dinosaur shirt, my sweatshirt. I noticed. I noticed. I'm pretty sure that's the one you interviewed in, right? More than likely, yes. <laughs> and it's not like this is too different from my everyday wear anyway, but, you know. Um, anyway, so before we get started with the, uh, the tour of the lab, I just want to remind everybody who's watching not to forget to check us, uh, check out bbpaleo.org slash events so that you can sign up for later tonight. We are doing another Zoom into the past with you, Jason. Hope you're ready. Right. <laughs> uh, and this time we're gonna be covering the mysteries of the Mother's Day Quarry, which is an area that we've been working for a couple of years now. Um, and it's really cool because there's actually been a lot of researchers there and ongoing research over a couple of decades really has lent us a lot of really cool information. Um, I will let you get to that later, but um, anyway, and then later on this month to celebrate Halloween, we're having a Cool paleo art party. Uh, we're going to be drawing or learning how to draw Therizinosaurus, which has absolutely the most insane claws ever. So uh, it's perfect for the spooky spirit of the season. Uh, that's a lot of S's. And <laughs> again, you can go to bbpaleo.org slash events to find out all the information about that. Um, and I will stop taking up any more time. Jason, uh, so excited to see around the lab. So I'll let you get to it. Yeah, no problem. So let me switch the camera here. All right. So there's actually a lot going on in here right now. Um, I'll just start right here. Um, it was a couple of years ago when we uh, really started getting some of the main jackets out from the Su2 site. Um, if you have been out with us, you know exactly what we're talking about. If you have not been out with us, we have two main areas where we work. One is the Mother's Day site that Devin just mentioned, and the other one is the, is one we call uh, the Su area or the Anderson area. And the highlight of that area is our Su2 specimen, and we call it that because we think it might be another Suawasia specimen, but we're not exactly sure yet. But bones like this are really going to help us figure that out. This is one of the neck vertebrae that came out of that site. Um, it's in pretty good shape. I'm going to mention Caitlin probably a couple times. She has been kind of running our lab for the last several months, including when everything was shut down and she had to put together bones like this in her dad's garage in the Poconos. So she's done an amazing job. And what's really cool about this bone is that right over there in the display case are some of the neck vertebrae from the original Suawasia, the type specimen that was dug up in 99 and 2000, um, in part by a, a team that Jason Poole was a part of. So if we want to see if that neck bone back behind me is really from Suawasia, then we're going to just take it right over there and and compare it and, and uh, see if it matches, essentially. Uh, we've got some bones from the Mother's Day site here. This is one of the best specimens. I really love it. I would love to, or I would love to stand it up and show you really how big it is and how impressive it is, but it's incredibly heavy, and I can't do that and hold the camera at the same time. But this is one of the vertebrae from the middle of the back from that same Su2 specimen. So again, we will compare this one to some of the bones from the original specimen upstairs in collections and see if they match. If it does, it's another Suawasia. If they don't, it's something else, and we'll figure that out too. Um, if you've been out with us, again, you will remember that the Sioux area or the Anderson area is just absolutely full of fossils, and everything up here on this cabinet is from this area. This is just a, the head of a femur, maybe the, the proximal or the the two thirds of the end of the femur where it attaches into the hips right here. And this was just laying out on top of the ground. We got it out a couple years ago. Caitlin, again, has done a great job of cleaning it off, putting a lot of the smaller pieces back together. 
Um, and now it's time to start putting the big pieces back together. And once we get everything glued together, if there are still holes in places, we will fill those holes with putty, like you can see here. So a little bit of work to do on that one. And this just sits out here, frankly, because it's so big, it's hard to find another spot for it, but also because it's really cool. It looks like a big rock, but it's actually not. That is also the head of a femur. This is the part that goes into the hips from one of those big long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Um, it's just a really, really big bone. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit tonight, at the, uh, talking about the Mother's Day site. But one of the things that we have found with a lot of our bones in our areas is that they're rel relatively small. This was a time when a lot of dinosaurs got truly, truly enormous. But most of the bones we find are from relatively small individuals. And we're trying to figure out why that is. This is one of the rare exceptions to that. That one's from a pretty big bone. And of course, the, we work in the Jurassic period and the Jurassic is famous for Allosaurus, the long neck, long tail dinosaurs, like Jason Poole's awesome drawing there, and Stegosaurs. And a few years ago, we had the distinct pleasure of finally finding and digging up our very first Stegosaur. If you remember those guys, those are a, uh, walked on four legs, uh, plates on their back and the big spikes on the end of their tails. Well, this is the femur from one of those stegosaurs. We've got a lot more of this dinosaur too. Several more leg bones, several fingers or toes, uh, several backbones, some ribs. And in one of those cabinets over there, the far left one, the whole thing is absolutely filled with more fragments of this guy that we have to, we still have to see if we can fit those together, but that is a very time consuming process. So we will get there. So we're very proud of our plants in our lab, it makes it feel homey. <laughs> and these are more bits from uh, uh, the SU2 specimen. Um, again, these should go back together and be more neck vertebrae or cervical vertebrae. Right now it looks like a mess, but Caitlin is already doing an amazing job of piecing things together, like all of that one and all of that one. Eventually, almost all of this will go back together. Lord knows I don't have the patience to do this kind of thing, but it takes uh, some extremely patient people like Caitlin to be able to figure out what these are, put them back together. So it's a patience, but it's also an incredible amount of anatomy knowledge and experience. Um, up here, I've got a couple of things that we just brought back from Montana. I just got back a couple weeks ago to go out and try to get some things that we had to leave in Montana in 2019 because our trailer and our truck was already full and they just they, literally nothing else would fit. Um, we don't have the big jackets that I brought back. Those are actually still in my driveway in suburban Philly. Um, those jackets turned out to be. Well, they, they suffered in the weather over the last year and they didn't, they're not very strong. So they are still sitting in the driveway because we thought trying to move it just one more time might damage the bones. So we're working on those there, but some cool things came out of that trip. Um, in the Sioux area or the Andes, Anderson area, we have another quarry called LZ Blue. And that's a cool one because there are lots and lots of bones uh, usually isolated bones from lots of different species. And obviously we weren't out there this summer. I walk right up to it and literally right on the ground is this massive foot or toe bone from an Allosaurus, just literally laying right on top. And it's not that we missed it last year, it's just we, we filled in the holes, we covered up the site with a lot of dirt, and this must have been mixed in there with it. Um, and over the last year, the dirt on top just weathered away. This is also from LZ Blue. This was a, a bone that we covered last year and couldn't get back because there wasn't any room on the trailer. Not exactly sure what this bone is, but it's doing something pretty unusual in how it's laying in the ground. It's almost vertical. And that's pretty interesting because that's not common. So we have to figure out why that is. Um, and then this was another bone that was just laying right out on top. It's not much to look at right now, but it's definitely a vertebra, uh, probably from a, a uh, maybe a stegosaur, not sure at all yet, but it was just laying right up on top. Again, we didn't miss it last year. It just wasn't uncovered yet. And erosion over the last uh, 13 or so months did the job for us. 
Um, if you've ever been to big museums, you will see that, you know, everything you see out on display is pretty cool, but that is always less than 1% of what is in the museum and what's in collections. And this is a great example of that. This is kind of part of our backlog of specimens that need to be worked on. Uh, these are jackets collected mostly last year, but some of them even earlier that just really need to be worked on. It's just that this is a, a very slow and time consuming patient process. And um, obviously there were some factors this year that made it even slower. Um, but we are, we yesterday actually was Tia's first day and you will meet Tia possibly, hopefully at one o'clock. She is our brand new lab manager. And this is all now her job to get through this um, and, and bring these dinosaurs kind of back to life. Got a lot more smaller jackets over here that need to be prepared. Uh, most of them from the Mother's Day quarry, but there's some LZ Blue stuff too. And then all of these cabinets are some prepared bones that are ready to be studied and taken away. But most of that is stuff that's still in plastic bags that we need to go through desperately. But again, finding the time and figuring out priorities because there's a lot to do in here. It actually looks a little bit clearer than usual, again, because we're eagerly anticipating Tia getting started in here. We also made room for those huge jackets that we thought were coming back from Montana. Ended up not happening. We couldn't bring the huge one back, but that's okay. We have plenty here to work on. One of the coolest specimens we've had in quite a while is one we call Al 2. Um, it's an Al, or Weird Al. It's an Allosaur, and it's really, really small, unusually small. Um, maybe not a baby, but certainly not a full-grown adult either. And Caitlin has been working hard on this specimen, and she's done a fantastic job. And we are, we and she are hoping to work on this soon and start describing it and, and get this specimen published. Um, there's a lot of leg bones in there, some ribs, not a whole lot to look at if you don't really know what you're looking at or if it's not right in front of you. But I did pull out some highlights of this specimen. We got a lot of beautiful claws from this guy, just in really, really good shape. We're really excited about these. You know, sometimes you find a bone and it, it, it only looks like something to you because you're trained in this and you've studied it and you know what it should look like. But anybody can immediately recognize and be impressed by these claws. There's also some really great toe bones in here. We've got a lot of this guy. There's not out here with us, but we have some of the skull, including the brain case, parts of the jaws and a lot of teeth. Um, at least one of the legs from top to bottom is very, very well preserved. Um, some ribs and some vertebrae. Again, a lot more really cool little toe bones. Oops, <laughs> there you go. There's a lot of really cool stuff in here. Look how tiny that toe bone is. That's almost cute. <laughs> I think it is adorable, Jason. Okay, thank you for <laughs> coming in to save me on that. <laughs> um, and then you've got these really, really good sized toe bones. So you can see and compare. We've got one of the legs, like I said, from top to bottom, from the top of the femur to the very end toes and claws is complete. And it's, it's really a gorgeous specimen. It was very, very fragile. And it was in a pretty tough spot to get it out. It was one of the spots that we could not just drive a truck up to, to grab, uh, to pull the jackets out. So Grace and Rick and Chris and a lot of other folks did a lot of very slow time consuming work on this and did a great job getting it out. So, um, as I said, the lab, oh, here's one of the uh, hail vertebrae of the SU2 specimen. If you have seen us on social media at any time in the last few months, almost certainly you have seen a picture of the tail laid out perfectly. And here's a good picture of it. Well, there's that. That is a Make-A-Wish family that joined us last summer. And the hips, that I went out there to get in Montana are right behind the family. This is the tail coming out, and it actually curls over itself like a, a little pigtail. It was a fantastic specimen. 
Here's another picture of it that's a little bit better. So this bone is one of those bones from the middle of the tail and one of the jackets that I went out to get a few weeks ago and is now sitting in my driveway is the most proximal caudal vertebrae. So that means the tail vertebrae that are most proximal or closest to the hips. And uh, our recollection was that there were two or three, uh, but it turns out there are at least four or five in there. And not just our recollection. Sometimes you know there, there's a bone or two in there and there may be more and there's supposed to be more, but you never really know until you open up the jacket. So, um, and they're in really great shape. We're excited to get those back here, have Tia clean them up and add them to the collection. And then as soon as we do, we can, we can lay all the bones back out just like they were in the ground. And it's really, really an impressive sight. Jason, I will say that's the coolest picture of you you will ever have. <laughs> well, the bar is very low, yes, but yes, that's a good one. <laughs> so, that's the lab. There are a lot of different things going on in here right now. I kind of, I'm excited for Tia, but at least yesterday I was a little bit feeling bad for her because her head must be spinning. Thrust in here to this new situation, lots and lots of different projects kind of happening simultaneously. It's a lot for her to take in, but um, I've seen her work and I'm, I'm excited to see what she can get done in here with all that. Yeah, I think that he is definitely up to the challenge. Um, and I am excited for her to get in to see what kind of stuff comes out of it because she's excited too. And of course, I'm going to be speaking to her hopefully live at one o'clock. Um, if not, then we'll just do another pre recorded video. Um, but Jason, I have to ask because it is National Fossil Day uh, what is the coolest fossil you've ever seen? Um, well, I'm going to answer the question what's the coolest fossil I've ever worked on? Is that okay? Perfect, yes. <laughs> Um, it's hard to top a dinosaur called Dreadnoughtus. When I first moved to Philly, uh, several years ago now, it was in part to work on my PhD on, uh, a dinosaur called Dreadnoughtus. It wasn't called Dreadnoughtus at the time because it was a brand new species and wasn't named for several years later, but it was one of these long neck, long tailed dinosaurs. Uh, but it wasn't a relatively small one like ours. It turned out to be one of the top five largest animals ever known to walk the earth. Wow. And it was amazingly complete. It was about 80% complete and almost entirely articulated. Um, and it was in Southern Patagonia. And we were really, really far out there. So that's kind of a combination of the coolest dinosaur, the coolest experience and all that. But also um, the other coolest dinosaur uh, fossil I've ever worked on was actually a baby mosasaur in Alabama that was nicknamed Artemis. And um, if you don't know what a mosasaur is, it's basically like a giant swimming Komodo dragon or in the last Jurassic Park where that ridiculously huge thing jumps out of the water and eats the shark. That's a mosasaur. They did not get that big, but this was a baby. Some of them could get to 50 feet long, but this was a baby literally just four or five, maybe six feet long, 100% complete to the point where there was still cartilage preserved between the vertebrae. And again, Devin, I'll let you call it cute. <laughs> um, but that it sounds was just so this, cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this tiny little baby mosasaur um, that was amazingly complete. It's hard to top either of those. Yeah, that's amazing. So you went from um, tiny and adorable to gigantic and dreadful. Um, <laughs> Definitely. It's quite a career there, Jason. That's impressive. Patagonia um, to Alabama. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, there are dinosaurs all over the planet, which is really incredible. And um, I actually do want to point this out that uh, when I talk to people about what we do and stuff like that, everybody, or not everybody, but quite a few people say to me, you know, oh, are there dinosaurs left to be found? Haven't you found them all? And it's so crazy to me that people just don't understand. We've only like touched the tip of the iceberg on this one. Uh, there are just so many different dinosaurs all over. 
Um, and just, it's incredible. It's really amazing to be out in the field and to dig it, dig dinosaurs and find them for yourself. Um, I'll tell you my personal fossil experience, you know, for the first time being out in the field um, was, I was sheer terror. You know, I just was sure that I was going <laughs> to break everything and you did it well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was really awesome. And of course, I'm biased because we have the coolest team and everybody was just super supportive and reassuring that I was not going to destroy any specimens. And it turned out to be really amazing. And I'm always baffled by how creative people get in the field. And uh, especially, I was working a lot at our site, LZ Blue. And, oh, sorry if you hear a helicopter go over. Um, but LZ Blue was kind of a jumble. I like the way Brittany uh, described it as a game of pickup sticks. Yeah. Um, just because it's just a tremendous amount of different dinosaurs and different fossils in one area. So. It really is. And there's no sign that they're slowing down. Again, two bones laying on top of the ground um that we just somehow missed last year and no sign that they're slowing down so that's going to be a main focus of next year we we need to expand that quarry in every direction laterally and we need to go down because it's not just a thin bone bed it's actually at least three feet deep which is also unusual so that site's going to keep us busy for quite a while that's amazing i'm so excited that's awesome yeah. so um I guess just final question and maybe, you know, from talking to Caitlin and talking to Tia, you have a much better grasp on this than I do. And, you know, from talking to Poole, but out of all the fossils that we have, uh, which has been the most challenging to prepare? Which best? Yeah, that's definitely a Caitlin and Poole question. Cause I, like I said, I don't have the patience to prep, but I would not, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb and suggest that that brain case from that small allosaur, AL2, is probably the most challenging because, um, well, it's small. Uh, the bones from theropods or meat eating dinosaurs are all hollow and very, very fragile. Um, I know that I didn't work the AL2 site. Rick really led that with Grace, and they both told me that some of those bones were practically paper thin. And, and, uh, a little bit, maybe not water soaked, we're in the desert, but they've clearly been affected by water and a little bit of weathering because they were not deeply buried. So those were extremely fragile and I don't envy them having worked on it, but they, those guys have a lot of patience and they did a great job. But yeah, some of those bones on the Allosaur skull, just paper thin, way, yeah. way above my abilities. <laughs> I remember going up to the site, um, you know, with, with Rick and Chris and, you know, they were pointing out where everything was. And I just, you know, even with everything mapped out, I was like, how are we going to get all of this collected? And they just did an incredible job. They really did. They, they managed to go between bones where there were only a few millimeters between them and create jackets and and you were talking about being creative earlier. Sometimes uh, field work forces you to be creative. And uh, I don't care if you've done this for 20 years, every single, getting every single bone out of the ground is slightly different. And that certainly was a very different situation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking as we're having this conversation about how paleontology requires so much teamwork to be able to accomplish these things even just as we're trying to fill in the picture of what those sites looked like and stuff like that um and then prepare it i am also somebody puzzles make me black I, <laughs> I just don't have the patience for it i instantly want to run away when i see the box <laughs> for a puzzle so the idea of a puzzle that doesn't have any edges, doesn't have a picture on it, maybe doesn't have all the pieces is, um, oh wow, I'm getting anxious just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, it's not for me. Yeah, but uh, so I will wrap this up. Jason, thank you so much for the tour of the lab. And I just wanna let everybody know 
that if you would like to visit the lab, this is um, open to the public at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. So you can come in and see everything that we're doing. We are, the museum and the lab are only open Fridays through Sundays uh, right now, but hopefully as COVID restrictions loosen up a little bit, we'll be able to expand that amount of time. And also mm -hmm. I know I've already gotten this question through um, on email, but uh, unfortunately, right now we're not taking volunteers for the lab just because of these restrictions. We're making sure that everybody is safe. Uh, so, but we love having volunteers in the lab. So we will definitely be letting, we will definitely let people know as those restrictions lift and as it becomes safe to have more people in the lab. Also, of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention that the 2021 field expedition is open for registrations and is also 50% full already. Um, uh, we are getting close to 60% full. So wow. yeah. Sign okay. Up so if you have that dream of digging for dinosaurs like I did and hundreds of people that have, visit, uh, have visited with us over the years, you know, absolutely consider it. It's you know, we've heard about some of the sites that we're working on and some of our goals for the field season and it's just going to be a really great time and it's going to be the adventure of your life. So uh, visit and us. We have a at, lot to do and we need a lot of help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so visit BB Paleo. So B-B-P-A-L-E-O dot org. Uh, and you can get all the information there. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody. Oh, yes, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and follow us on social media. Um, yeah. But uh, so thank you so much for joining us and for watching this. We're so sorry we couldn't go live with you today, uh, but we look forward to connecting soon and we'll see you later. Happy National Fossil Day. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Devin.